All right, we'll try again. Woo, that's better. Happy Friday afternoon, everyone. Thanks to all of you for coming to today's uh, Timothy A. Johnson Medical Scholar Seminar. Uh, as most of you in the room know, this is a seminar series that is targeted at bringing in practicing physicians who are also very active in terms of biomedical research. So sort of bridging that, that gap between um, the bench and actual practice with our with patients. So we're very excited today um, to have an exemplar of that with us. And I'm gonna let um, Dr. Pan introduce him in a minute, but this is also a chance for me to invite any of you uh, in the room or watching to nominate Medical Scholar Seminar speakers for next year. So many of you will have received an email for students. There's Canvas announcements where you can suggest uh, physicians who are actively doing research for next year's seminar series. So um, please think about that um, over the next week or two and get those nominations into us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand uh, this over now to Dr. Albert Pan, who, who is the host for today's Medical Scholar Speaker. Thank you. Um, it's my honor to uh, introduce Dr. Kerry Kumar. And um, Dr. Kumar was born and raised in Rochester, Minnesota. And I think that's where they learned that minus 40 is the same for Celsius and Fahrenheit. Um, he got his bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota. And then he was accepted into the MD PhD program at Washington University in, in St. Louis, um, where he published really a series of elegant work on the neuromuscular junction, which is the synaptic connection between the nerve and the muscle. And he showed very beautifully, uh, both in vitro and in vivo, that the postsynaptic membrane has the ability to self-organize, even in the absence of nerves, and really kind of shift the way people think about what putative presynaptic organizers are doing at neuromuscular synapses and potentially also central nervous system synapses. So after a very successful uh, MD-PhD uh, career, he went to Boston and did his clinical residency and fellowship in urology and neurocritical care at Harvard Medical School. And it's during that time that I almost killed him by giving him contaminated dim sum, but thankfully a hospital was nearby and he survived. <laughs> And then uh, after that, uh, Terry returned to Washington University in 2012 to become a physician scientist. And his career has really progressed very rapidly at Washington University. He is currently an associate professor of neurology and he also served as the associate division chair for neurocritical care and also the medical director of the Neurotrauma ICU at Marsh Jewish Hospital. And he currently leads a very active research lab and focusing on the basic mechanisms of traumatic brain injury and its connection to Alzheimer's disease and other dementia, uh, dementias. And what's unique about his research program is he really combines his intimate knowledge of the synapse with these complex diseases that affect many different brain regions. And his lab developed a new mouse model for TBI that mimics very common human TBI that does not result in focal contusion, but produces progressive uh, behavioral deficits over time. And then more recently, uh, Dr. Kumar's lab pioneered a very sophisticated imaging technique that can capture diffuse synaptic changes in different TBI and Alzheimer models. And I'm sure, uh, Terry will share many of his findings and I'm really excited about um, how different labs will use techniques and different uh, models. And lastly, um, Terry's work has been supported by uh, several major grants, uh, including uh, NINDS K08 Clinical Investigator Award, a Bright Focus Foundation Alzheimer Award, a Brain Research Foundation Award, and recently a NIH R01 Award to study the synaptic degeneration occurring in TBI. Uh, the title of his talk is Synaptic Injury, A Link to the Past. And let's uh, welcome Dr. Kumar.
Okay, hopefully you can all hear me all right. Um, Albert knows that we, we uh, had instruction in how to give presentations from Jeff Lickman at WashU. One of the things that Jeff said was never to start a talk with an apology. So I'm not apologizing for the fact that I got COVID. <laughs> I don't feel like that's my fault, but uh, it definitely has impacted my voice. So uh, if you know you guys want me to repeat something, please don't hesitate to ask. And this is a pretty intimate group. So um, you know, ask questions, raise your hand, let me know what you want to talk about. Uh, I've had such a great visit so far. Thank you, Albert, for inviting me. This has been terrific. Um, in addition to just getting to see Albert again and catch up, um, what wonderful conversations about the way the medical school is working. And uh, I'm still thinking about, uh, Alexi, your work on uh, 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 leadership and the implications for, um, for humans, for some of the, the, the amazing things that you're doing. So it's been super stimulating. Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to more conversations. Um, so let me get started. As, as Albert mentioned, uh, I am at Washington University where I have a clinical specialty in neurocritical care and a research specialty and clinical specialty in traumatic brain injury. And we have been particularly interested in the connections between TBI and neurodegeneration. Um, and I'm going to tell you about that today and tell you about some of the work that we've been doing along those ends. <laughs> So to kick things off, I don't have any disclosures except the funding sources to tell you about. The overview of what I want to talk to you about today, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you up to speed on where we are clinically and scientifically with respect to TBI as an extremely important form of acute brain injury. And I'm going to tell you about some of the connections between TBI and downstream neurodegeneration and why we find that topic so fascinating. I'm going to take a pretty deep dive into tool building. Um, because we spent the past several years developing something that we, uh, a technique that we call sequin, and I want to tell you about that. I want to encourage you to use it and facilitate uh, uh, those efforts that you know might might be ongoing in the future collaborations in your own lab. Um, we're going to talk about synaptic injury and in, in traumatic brain injury and in Alzheimer's disease. Um, that's largely the work of uh, I've, I've highlighted some of some of the people that have done this work in the lab: Andrew Sauerbeck and Akshita Korgenkar. And then we're going to talk about a couple different mechanisms that we're pursuing with respect to synaptic injury. And we've been focused primarily on neuroinflammation, and that's work of Akshita Korgenkar, both humoral and cellular neuroinflammation. And more recently, I'll give you some a, a preliminary look into some of the work that we're doing with respect to proteinopathy and its potential impact on synaptic injury. So let's let's start at a very high level, and I want to I want to put TBI into context for you because I find that many audiences um, have never really been forced to grapple with the um, incredible public health impact of traumatic brain injury. So some of the ways that you may have heard about TBI reaches your you know many of our ears through the uh, the, the popular press. It's been called the silent epidemic. It's been called the signature injury of our modern wars. Um, and, and some of the reasons we, we we call it the silent epidemic are number one. Um, as, as I already mentioned, the public health impact is largely unknown uh, by, by the public. And number two, the scars that it leaves are hidden. So, you know, it's like, unlike a lot of other neurological diseases where you maybe maybe the left arm isn't working right or can't walk, can't see, can't talk. Traumatic brain injury has, in most cases, subtler but no less impactful multi-system deficits involving cognition and emotional regulation and so on. Um, two and a half million ED visits, and these numbers are 10 years old now, 282,000 a year hospitalized in the U.S., over 50,000 a year die of traumatic brain injury. But take a look at these dot plots. So what I've done here is I've assembled data with respect to brain, acute brain injury more than mild, you know, different types of acute brain injury. And, and, you know, we think of that kind of acute brain injury, you're really thinking about vascular brain injury, traumatic brain injury, and then a smattering of other kinds like infection, like epilepsy, you know, severe status epilepticus. So when you look at that, the number of hospitalizations for TBI is indicated here in blue um, versus two different forms of vascular brain injury, hemorrhagic and ischemic. And it's always a surprise to neurologists when I show this slide, the, the tremendous fraction of hospitalizations that exist for uh, a greater than mild acute brain injury due to trauma. And when you look at deaths, it's an even greater representation. Um, so all of this, putting this together with the fact that TBI tends to affect a younger cohort of victims than vascular brain injury. You get this, this fact that I've indicated here in red and bold, that TBI is the single most common cause of permanent disability in young people. Uh, so that's people under the age of 45 in Western countries. So that's, that's one important take home message from today's talk. Now, the impacts of TBI extend well beyond this acute phase. <clears throat> that's another one of the take home messages. And here's where this link to the past comes in. Um, and and I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Zelda fan. I don't know if any, I'm super excited about the new Zelda that's coming on the Switch on 
May 12th. So my son and I are constantly talking about this and thinking about this. So this has been on my mind. Um, anyways, the, one of the one of the video games I grew up playing was Zelda: A Link to the Past. So I I think of synapses as we you know we're thinking about why does why does this patient have sporadic Alzheimer's disease? Why does this patient have this neurogenitive condition? And some of this might be prior, you know, some of it has to be, of course, prior environmental exposures, uh, like traumatic brain injury. So this is a classic report by Plasman and colleagues from a military cohort demonstrating for the first time in a you know, fairly rigorous way, the increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia later in life, decades later, as a result of a early traumatic brain injury. Um, showing this increased risk uh, that is uh, dependent on the severity of the injury. Now, others since this publication have taken this publicate have taken this idea further. It's been replicated many times. This is a particularly important uh, study by Fanning colleagues in a Danish cohort. It's a large population-based study, like three million uh, patients in a, a population database, an extremely well characterized database, where they looked and they said, in one database, is there a, is there a history of a brain injury? And then in a second database down the road, is there a history of a diagnosis of dementia? And what's, what's fascinating here is that unlike Plasman and colleagues and several other reports, they were able to demonstrate a connection between even mild brain injury and mild TBI or concussive TBI as we say these days, and an increased risk of a dementia illness later in life. And, and they, they did that with the exceptionally strong control group of patients with trauma, but no TBI. And they showed a dose dependence as well, which is shown here, um, uh, here, where you see the increasing numbers of brain injuries results in an increasing risk of a dementing illness later in life. Others have made connections on the basis of structural and mechanistic factors between early TBI and later neurodegeneration. This is from David Sharp and colleagues, showing that if you image a patient with a traumatic brain injury with MRI years after the TBI, and then you image them again a year later, you see progressive volume loss in excess of what you would expect as a result of just aging. So TBI induces some kind of long-term neurodegenerative atrophy-inducing process in the brain. Um, others have taken this further with, in this case, neuroinflammation from Wiley Stewart and colleagues, where they are showing, in this case, 64 years of age 16 years post-TBI, a continued persistent elevated level of cellular neuroinflammation of the brain um, as a result of, of an early brain injury. So TBI sets up a long-term neurodegenerative neuroinflammatory process in the brain. Here's uh, data on proteinopathy, um, looking at the accumulation of phosphorylated isoforms of tau and uh, pathological uh, isoforms of beta amyloid that appear and persist in the brain for decades after a traumatic brain injury. And of course, all of this in a sense culminates in this new modern diagnosis of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is in a lot of ways uh, an agglomeration of all of those factors I mentioned where there's severe volume loss, cognitive deficits, neuroinflammation, and uh, uh, all, accumulation of Alzheimer's related dementia related proteins, in this case, phosphorylated isoforms of tau in unique patterns that haven't been observed before. In, in dementia illness. So this is a unique clinical pathological entity. Nonetheless, it demonstrates again, the interrelatedness between trauma and, and dementing processes in the brain. So all of this leads us to, to the idea, this is again a take home message, that TBI is not a monophasic illness. TBI is not like a one and done. TBI rather is the trigger of a chronic neurodegenerative process that increases the risk of dementia later in life. So I told you already that traumatic brain injury is the most common cause of permanent disability in the first half of life. Um, but but in, in addition to that, it's the strongest epigenetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease in the second half of life. So it just, again, highlights the, the incredible public health impact of brain trauma. Um, and, and to operationalize that in a slightly different way from, from my perspective as a clinician taking care of patients with TBI, in the ICU, when we have patients with acute brain injury, we think, of a, we think of primary brain injury and secondary brain injury. And primary brain injury is, is what happens in the field. Right? It happens at the time of the injury. Unfortunately, nothing I can do about that. Um, they come to me, and we, we see them undergo a process of secondary brain injury that lasts days to weeks, during which time things like low blood pressure or dysregulated glucose metabolism or hyperthermia leads to ongoing brain injury. And it's our job as, as uh, intensive care physicians to try to prevent that to whatever extent we can and support the recovery of the brain. 
what we are trying to now recognize with traumatic brain injury specifically, but likely this is applicable to lots of forms of acute brain injury that have felt like more monophasic injuries, is a decades-long period of tertiary injury that happens uh, at the end of, that starts at the end of secondary brain injury and lasts well into adulthood and old age for these patients with uh, you know, injuries at a relatively young age and leads to these long-term cognitive deficits. So we are trying to understand and interrupt that process. Um, so the question, of course, is you know, where, where do we go looking for these connections between early brain trauma and long-term neurodegeneration? And you know, we took the, the standpoint of let's actually look at the connection. So we, we wanted to look at synapses. Um, and, and the reasons for that were multiple. But I'll point out now that I'll, in the past several decades, it, there's been a growing recognition that Alzheimer's disease in particular, but also to an extent, other forms of common forms of neurodegeneration are really at their base synaptopathies. They're injuries to synapses. Um, and, and some have, on the basis of this strong evidence from numerous different fields, some have gone so far as to suggest that synaptic pathology may be a common shared mechanism in neurological injury. Um, so we took the standpoint of, let's try to understand gray matter injury Let's try to understand synaptic endpoints in TBI and perhaps the processes set in motion that damage synapses potentially early might then lead to worsened synaptopathies later in life. Um, and, and we've taken a number of approaches to this. This is from a, a recent um, review article uh, by the Spires Jones lab. And I think it nicely sort of schematizes, not expected, but nicely schematizes the work that we've done. Um, so I'm going to tell you first about our efforts to understand synaptic degeneration and trauma. Um, then I'm going to uh, move on from there to tell you about a couple different mechanistic arms, one related to uh, uh, neuroinflammation and one related to proteinopathy. So let me start out by kind of setting the stage for you to understand uh, our approach to this problem. Um, I, I mentioned to you already that the field, the neurotrauma field, had been focused primarily on white matter. And, and that's, you know, these, these axonal pathways. And I liken that at least to an extent, to a street light effect, where we've got bright lights shining on these axonal pathways, but this dark forest of synaptic connections had been largely unilluminated. And the reason for that uh, is because, for who knows what reason, we have had excellent histological and now radiographic biomarkers of axonal injury for 50 plus years, since you know classic papers that were released in the middle of the century demonstrated white matter injury with these positive histological markers and again, subsequently radiological markers have made it easy to understand that form of injury. It is after all, a, a, you know, as far as it goes, a fairly simple area of the brain, right? Um, these this, these uh, axons and the myelin sheaths, as opposed to these connections, which are, are, as you can imagine, much more challenging to study. So, so we felt that part of the, part of the historic uh, focus on white matter might be a street light effect, Let's try to, to go some distance towards you know, tools have evolved. Let's try to try to understand some, some of the gray matter injury that might be happening in trauma. Um, so we had to solve a couple of problems to do that. And, and here I like to trot out this slide that uh, my mentor and, and Albert's mentor, Josh Sains, and, and our, our co-mentors, uh, Jeff Lickman, had put together a long time ago to illustrate why they studied the neuromuscular synapse. Um, and the reason they, they love this slide because it, it shows how dramatically larger and isolated this structure is versus central synapses, which are not only much smaller, but this really doesn't do justice to the fact that they're so tightly packed within the brain that the issue is really not so much imaging them as resolving them from their neighbors. So we, have, we, we felt we had two problems. One was resolving, which this kind of helps to illustrate the problem. And the second was identifying, which subsequent work by the Lichtman lab gives you an indication of, of the challenges inherent in that problem. Um, this is from uh, uh, Castori et al., this, this now relatively uh, famous paper from the Lickman lab, where they uh, annotated, they, they uh, prepared a serial EM, fully saturated annotation of a very vanishingly small area of mouse cortex. Here is just the area surrounding in a column, two primary dendrites from two pyramidal neurons. And the take home message here is that neuropil, you know, as you already knew, is exceptionally complex. So it, it isn't even enough to have markers of synapses. You have to deal with all of the nonspecific signal that you inevitably will pick up, trying to disentangle, trying to separate the wheat from the chaff, essentially. Not just resolving them, but separating them from all the other signals that are present in the brain. So those are the two problems we felt we had to solve. 
And we took two approaches to, to solving this problem. This is work of uh, primarily Andrew Sauerbeck in the lab um, and, and Sidney Wrights, who's a graduate student who's all, about to graduate with us. The technique we came up with, we called sequin for synaptic evaluation and quantification by imaging nanostructure. Um, and the way that we dealt with the resolving issue was to pull out a form of super resolution microscopy that I'll tell you about. Um, and the way that we dealt with identifying the synapses was to use localization microscopy based approaches. Um, so let's dig into those two now. Um, I want to first talk about resolving the synapses. So what I've done here is I've created a histogram of the frequency of observation of nearest neighbor distances between postsynaptic densities in the mouse cortex. So this is, this is taken directly from, uh, from data that uh, the Lickman lab has produced with that fully annotated data set I mentioned. And all I've done is measured the distances between them and plotted them out as a histogram. So it gives you an idea of the problem, right? If we want to resolve all of these from one another, we're going to have to have a technique that's operating around here to capture everything. So what are our choices? Well, we've long known that electron microscopy can solve this problem. Electron microscopy has exquisite sensitivity, has no difficulty with this. But the problem is the challenge is inherent in the preparation of the tissue, the imaging of the tissue, and most important, the analysis of the tissue. Um, the annotation of those data sets is incredibly laborious. So we didn't feel like that was a good place to start. On the other side of the spectrum, confocal microscopy you can get about half of them. Um, and it's much easier to prepare that tissue. I, I suspect that many in the, in the room have done this. Um, it's much easier to image and the analysis, if appropriately set up, is not that challenging either. Uh, but the problem is you're at best, you're gonna get about half of the synapses and the others will fall below the resolution limit. There's a technique called a ray tomography that some of you are familiar with, which tries to combine the strengths of electron microscopy and confocal microscopy or optical imaging. Um, the problem is it reintroduces a lot of the uh, laborious elements of electron microscopy. At the end of the day, it's an ultrasection based approach. So we took uh, an approach based on the area scan microscope, which preserves the ease of use of confocal microscopy but brings in just enough resolving power that we can get some 97, sorry, here it is, 97% of that distribution. So it turns out that you don't need a lot of super resolution to capture this entire distribution. You just need a modest amount. Um, so we tried to find the right balance and that for us turned out to be this area scan approach. So let me tell you about it. Um, the area scan microscope is now a commercial microscope made by Zeiss. It's based on a technique that's been around for a long time called image plane scanning microscopy. And the idea is that unlike a confocal microscope where you have a confocal pinhole and then a single uh, PMT detector, the area scan microscope has this compound eye detector composed of 32 different PMTs and gets rid of the pinhole. So rather than, rather than try to uh, uh, isolate the, uh, the, the imaging with the pinhole to a single optical section, the area scan microscope just captures the entire point spread distribution and then uses deconvolution and I won't go into the mechanisms of that, but it uses a deep convolution algorithm that is informed by direct hardware-based knowledge of the point spread function to achieve super resolution. Moreover, it increases the sensitivity quite substantially because you're collecting the entire point spread function and then reassigning the pixels where they belong on the basis of the deconvolution. So here's, here's the result. This is an image of, um, I believe these are uh, postsynaptic densities that are being imaged with confocal microscopy. And here I'm taking this one and I'm showing you what it looks like in Z, stretched out in Z as we expect, because the resolving power in Z is never as good as it is in X and Y. When we do the same thing using the airy scan approach, not only do we resolve these in X and Y much better and pick up many faint puncta that were basically invisible using confocal, we're now able to resolve the fact that there are actually two puncta here on top of each other in Z, which you can see using this line scan, we can clearly see that there are two puncta using area scan, whereas we struggle to do that with confocal. So the overall technique starts with staining the brain, labeling the brain against pre and post synaptic markers, in this case, PSD95 and synapsin, and then imaging the brain using the area scan microscope at a progressively higher resolution until we end up with this imaged volume, three-dimensional volume of tissue where we can see individual pre and post synaptic puncta. So that's the labeling and imaging side of things. What we need to do then is understand how we are going to identify the synapses that are in that imaged volume. So far, we have, we have markers of pre and post synaptic puncta. We already know from the electron microscopy, the correlated light EM literature, that the majority of those markers will not be synaptic. They're bits of protein floating through the cell. 
their background, their non-specific labeling. So now we have to figure out how to identify them. And we decided that the best way to do that would be to try to measure the distance between the pre and the postsynaptic structures. We felt that, you know, on the basis of ultrastructure, on the, uh, on the basis of higher super resolution approaches, like in this case, storm, that we ought to be able to come up with a consistent distance that is indicative of a biological synapse. So in order to figure what that distance would be, we sat a couple of undergraduates down with a huge uh, uh, FibSim data set, and we said, measure the distance between the presynaptic vesicle reserve pool, which we felt would be most indicative of where we would see the centroid of the synapsin marker and the PSD, and just iterate that over hundreds of synapses. So they did that, and they came up with a pre to postsynaptic separation of around 200 nanometers. So that was our target, something around 200 nanometers, recognizing, of course, that different techniques have different uh, amounts of you know, unfortunate shrinkage as a result of the tissue processing. Next, we took our data, again, this is PSD95, we ran it through an image analysis software package which identified all of the puncta. Um, and that's what you see in this imaged volume is all of those puncta identified as either being pre or postsynaptic. Now, again, the majority of those are not gonna be synapses. So what we had to do there was, was go about trying to measure the distance between a presynaptic and a postsynaptic punctum. And in order to convince ourselves that we could do that, uh, we pulled out uh, uh, nano rulers. And, and these are tiny little fluorescent rulers that are created with a technique called DNA origami, um, which as you can see here, can create vanishingly small structures using the unique folding patterns, unique and predictable folding patterns of DNA. Um, so uh, the way this, this, these nano rulers are created is by engineering a DNA molecules, fluorescent probes at various points such that it will fold so, such that those probes are separated by known distances. So then we can take this, we can put it in the, in the area scan microscope. We can image the uh, probes at the end, the probe in the middle. Here again is what it looks like with confocal. There's really no hope of, of measuring that. And here we can measure the separation between these two and the inter- uh, uh, intermarker separation because these are spectrally distinct. Uh, and and we, what we find is that those measurements correspond quite nicely with what we were expecting. So we felt we had the ability to measure distances in this microscope on the order of what would be necessary. Uh, we felt that we had done a good job of identifying the pre and postsynaptic puncta and finding the centroids in three-dimensional space. So we, we merely now had to put these two together. Um, and, and this is what we've done. So <clears throat> the way this analysis works, <clears throat> is for every, let's say, postsynaptic marker punctum, <clears throat> we look at its centroid, and then we measure the distance between that centroid and every presynaptic centroid in the field, every one. And we simply tabulate those, we find the smallest number, and we record that as, as an entry in the data table, right? So that distance becomes an entry. Then we do it for the next one, and we iterate over the entire imaged volume. We can do this with the reference being a postsynaptic marker. We can do it with the reference being a presynaptic marker. It doesn't really matter. They both work. What we find then when we plot the frequency of observed separations is this bimodal distribution where we have an early spike and then we have this much wider aftergoing peak. Um, so what we suspected was that this early spike represented synapses and that this later aftergoing peak represented nonspecific pairing between pre and postsynaptic markers that really had nothing to do with one another. In order to, to try to convince ourselves that that was the case, we did a couple of things. The first is we flipped this data set. So we took one of the channels, the PSD, and we rotated 180 degrees. So now we have the same spatial statistics, we have the same number of puncta, the same density clumping of puncta, but we've broken all the biological relationships within the tissue. So now anything we measure is, is going to, by definition, be random and noise. And what we found when we did that was we preserved this later peak, but we lost the early peak. So that again convinced us that whatever it was that we were measuring here was some kind of real biological periodicity. The next thing we did was we overlaid on this, the data that we pulled from the EM, and we found a very nice overlap between the distances measured by EM and the distances that we were measuring um, using the super resolution approach. So that again gave us the confidence that, that these indeed represent uh, synaptic loci. So at the end of the day, here's what the technique looks like. You take your tissue, you immunolabel it against pre and post synaptic markers. We've done this on slide, we've done this in, you know, in, in free solution. Um, we 
I, I say clear, but really what we're doing here is we're refractive index matching the tissue. That, that turns out to be the most critical uh, part of collecting high quality data is effective refractive index matching. Um, so we're not removing lipids per se, trying to clear and prevent light scattering. Rather, we're trying to deal with spherical aberration. We find that very important. Then we collect the data on the area scan uh, uh, system. We end up with 32 single channel data sets, which we run through a pre-processing pipeline, um, again, using software that's created by the makers of this microscope, although there are now third party uh, uh, software makers as well that can do this. And we end up with, with a, a high quality uh, image. We take that, we run it through puncta detection. We had been doing this with uh, Imaris, which is um, uh, an image analysis software package, but we've now moved all this into Python. So this is all freely available. Um, we run our pre and post synaptic nearest neighbor localization analysis. We get this bimodal frequency distribution, and then we simply integrate under this first peak. And that's the, that's the number of, of uh, synaptic endpoints in the tissue. Um, so one of the first things we did was we asked, do these synapses that we are imaging have characteristics that one would expect um, in the mouse brain? And we, we, uh, I'll show you just some of that data. We've asked this question in a few different ways. One is, do we, do, does, does the axis, the pre to post synaptic axis, have any kind of bias, right? We, is that detection bias? Because after all, our, our imaging is not isometric. So we were concerned that we would be biased towards detecting certain kinds of synapses and not others, depending on the orientation. Fortunately, we found that not to be the case. This is just plotting the orientation of hundreds of different synapses within an image volume. They appear to be random, which is what we expected, thankfully. Uh, we also asked about the spatial orientation of synapses relative to one another. Here, every dot represents a synaptic locus in a thinly imaged area of cortex. Um, now, we're imaging in a uh, cortex where we know that the primary dendrites of the pyramidal neurons are oriented radially. So we, we hoped that there would be some kind of radial bias. We expected there to be some kind of radial bias. And indeed, we saw a, a weak radial bias. Again, it, something that I think is unlikely to have evolved uh, as a result of an artifact. So again, gives us confidence that we are truly looking at synaptic endpoints here. So then we took the technique, we expanded it in a number of ways. We tried to make it as useful as we could. Here I'm showing you that we can apply this approach to imaging human tissue. So this is potentially applicable to this, um, this huge quantity of archival tissue that exists uh, in many different brain biobanks uh, across the world. This is just a, uh, an individual we zoomed in and imaged uh, pre and post synaptic markers in a, in a few different samples. And, and again, we can do this, uh, this analysis. We've expanded to look at different types of synaptic subsets. So in this case, <clears throat> we're, we're simultaneously labeling with our pre and our post synaptic marker, but now we've layered onto that <clears throat> excuse me, markers for mGluR5, the metrabotropic glutamate receptor, and GluN2B. And we can, we can say for every synaptic locus defined again by a pre-postsynaptic separation uh, with our classic markers, uh, do we see either of these two as present or not present? And we can define loci that have none, loci that have one or the other, or loci that have both, um, facilitating analysis of different molecularly defined synaptic subsets. Um, and, and then we can, we can go further with that and ask, well, how do these subsets vary by region, for example? Looking in three different regions of the brain, we see different quantifications of, in this case, mGluR5 positive synaptic loci. We can ask about unique features of mGluR5 positive synaptic loci. They, for example, appear to have different orientations within the cortex versus mGluR5 negative synaptic loci, implying perhaps a differential localization to primary versus secondary dendrites and pyramidal neurons. We can extract a very large number of data points from each synapse, over 400 different um, potentially valuable data points from every synapse. And then we can ask how those populations differ by using principal component analysis or linear discrimination analysis, uh, finding that they're across multiple different axes. These n are five positive and negative synapses appear to be different from each other. Here, drilling down on just presynaptic volume, one can see that the n are five positive synapses seem to have a slightly larger presynapse volume than in or five negative synapses. One of the things I think is most exciting is the ability to roll out this technique over large areas of tissue because it's a fully automated imaging pipeline with an automated stage. One can, in this case, image the entire hippocampus in a, in a section and uh, uh, do this at synaptic resolution uh, in order to create, for the first time, uh, maps of synaptic density across these large structures. And the impact of disease processes, in this case, uh, Alzheimer's related beta amyloidosis on synaptic density over time. Um, now this image took us 36 hours to acquire. That's not active time, it's like an hour to set it up and then 36 hours of letting the microscope run. Um, 
we have done better, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but I first want to highlight other things that can be done with a with a you know a completely novel uh, and unprecedented data set like this. For example, one can map other synaptic qualities across uh, across different regions of the hippocampus. In this case, we're looking at um, different areas of stratum radiatum, um, stratum lacculosa molecular, and what we find. Um, using the presynaptic markers, the size of the presynaptic terminal seems to be smaller in SLM versus other areas of the molecular layer of CA1, which was, an, again, a novel observation. Now, um, this is as far as we've gotten so far. Um, because of advancements uh, both in our approach and in, in the imaging hardware and software, this is now an entire brain section acquired at synaptic resolution. This took 16 hours. Um, so a single overnight scan. We've taken this to the point where you can set this up when you when you leave for the day, come home, uh, sorry, come back the following day, take your slide off and, and have this data set. 7,683 images, over 2 million synaptic loci characterized, some 1.5 terabytes of data, all pulled down in a single overnight scan. And this is just me zooming in progressively in the hippocampus. Um, where did I think I put it right there? Uh, showing you that we can see individualized synaptic, uh, pre and post synaptic markers and, and do our quantification. Uh, on those fields. So that's that's tool development. Now let me um, step back and tell you about some of the applications of this. So first I'll start with neurodegeneration. Um, synaptic uh, injury and neurodegeneration looking at Alzheimer's disease. This is a model of beta amyloidosis again. Here's a, a beta amyloid plaque and we're quantifying synaptic density as a function of distance from the plaque and showing the closer you get in two different models, the APPPS1 and the APPNLF. One sees a drop off in, in, in synaptic density. It's a little bit just uh, picky, low hanging fruit. We expected to see this. Others have shown this with the ray tomography. So that was good to see. Um, this was more novel information. We looked in the PS19 model of tauopathy and demonstrating the interneuronal cortex that we see a modest uh, but statistically significant drop off in synaptic density in that area. And then that, of course, is in addition to the atrophy that occurs in that area, which only amplifies the amount of actual synapses that are being lost in an absolute sense. Here we're looking in Parkinson's disease. This is work in collaboration with Thomas Beter or at Yale um, on an ASAP funded project where uh, this is a model of uh, uh, preformed fibril injection into the brain. Um, and, and here, uh, Andrew has looked at the localization using our, our techniques uh, of, of characterizing synaptic molecular subsets, the localization of phosphosynuclein, so pathological isoforms of synuclein to the synapse and quantifying that localization uh, uh, as a function of the region of the brain. Um, this is early work that we're very excited about. Now, let me let me backtrack to uh, to talk about the thing that I care about most about, which is traumatic brain injury. Here, I just very briefly introduced to you um, the model of TBI that we've used for these experiments. Um, as Albert mentioned, this is a model we created in the lab called Mod Chimera. Um, and the way uh, the technique works, it's a it's a closed head model of both impact and inertial injury to the brain. We put the animal to sleep on a platform, and then a piston is fired up a barrel. So this is this is like a gun, basically, a pneumatic gun, but the bullet doesn't leave the barrel. The bullet is constrained to stay in the barrel, but it has a peg that exits and hits the mouse. Um, we monitor the velocity here, so we know exactly how much energy we're imparting to the animal, and then the animal actually rotates away and comes to rest on a padded platform 180 degrees uh, distant. What we find, and you know, the reason that, one of the reasons we developed this is that there are no focal lesions in this model, and you know, we felt that, as I was talking to the students about, um, there wasn't much point with the dominant models of the day, uh, uh, fluid percussion injury and control cortical impact of looking at synaptic injury and gray matter because they were just large scale destroying the gray matter. So we like this model because it, you know, again, much like the human condition in all but the most severe cases of TBI does not cause a focal lesion in the brain. It, the, the injury is diffuse. Nonetheless, these animals have neurobehavioral deficits that we can study and correlate to our pathological endpoints. So, so what did we find? Uh, we looked in superficial areas of cortex here uh, over time after the traumatic brain injury, and we saw this progressive loss of synapses uh, happening um, in our brain injury animals uh, using the sequent approach. Now, because it was a new technique, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to verify this using electron microscopy, which, which I'm showing you here. And this is just demonstrating some of the uh, synaptic pathology that we see with EM. Uh, but, but probably most importantly here is the small number, so we didn't quite reach statistical significance, but the effect size is almost the same. Um, at 30 days, we see this, I'm sorry, seven days, we see this drop off in the, uh, the density of excitatory synapses in the cortex. Um, okay, so that, that's the discussion I have for 
the, the, the development of, of the synaptic injury, uh, uh, sorry, imaging technique and its application to various disease models. What I wanna do now, <clears throat> now that we thought we had, uh, we had an interesting phenomenon to study, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a couple different approaches we've had to understand the mechanism of synaptic injury in TBI. And I'm gonna start by telling you about uh, uh, neuroinflammation, both cellular and humoral. And this is the work of Akshita Korvankar, who's a postdoc in the lab who subsequently uh, moved on and she's in industry now. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, uh, proteinopathies. So Akshita wanted to understand the role of, um, of neuroinflammation in this process. And it, as many of you in the room will know, um, we've known for some time that microglia and complement play an important role in synapse pruning, both as a normal developmental process and as a pathological, what we believe to be a pathological process in setting the neurodegeneration. So we were interested to ask whether those same, um, those, those same pathways might be active uh, as a result of, of brain trauma. So what Akshan did was she, she actually ended up using this focal uh, model. She wanted to look at the hippocampus. Um, and at that time in the evolution of the, of the diffuse model, we weren't seeing a lot in the way of hippocampal pathology. We, we, we've since been able to make some changes in the model uh, uh, to give us a little bit more of a handle on the hippocampus. Um, but, but this, what she did was she tuned the focal injury model very carefully to not cause direct injury to the hippocampus. Now here you see what it does to the cortex, which is why I was sort of hesitant to look at cortical endpoints in the model. But she tuned it so that it didn't cause direct injury to the hippocampus. Um, and then she applied the sequent approach to, see, to the CA1 molecular layer, was able to quantify uh, uh, synaptic endpoints. Let's see if this is gonna work better, yeah. Uh, and then she measured the loss of synapses as a result of trauma over time and, and found that Again, uh, over time, one sees a loss of excitatory synaptic endpoints in CA1 um, uh, in this model system. So that, that, that was the, the idea that we uh, wanted to try to address. Um, and she then looked at the role of microglia, so the role of cellular immunity. And the way she did that was she used um, a CSFR1 inhibitor called uh, um, uh, PLX, I think she was using at that point, 3397. Now is a, is a newer version of this. And the nice thing about this is it, it's administered through the chow and it eliminates within a couple of weeks, it eliminates you know, 90 plus percent of the microglia in the brain. It's, a, it's a, a directly toxic to their, uh, their survival. Um, so what she did was she quantified, uh, she quantified synapses plus or minus injury and plus or minus this, uh, uh, this CSFR1 inhibitor. And what she found, as you already saw, is that in, in, with a sham diet, uh, there's, there's a loss of synapses uh, in the setting of trauma, but when one in, uh, gets rid of the microglia, uh, one doesn't see that, that significant loss of synapses, suggesting that microglia are required for this process. Um, she then asked about uh, the, the mechanism, how the microglia might be recognizing the synapses, and, and one of the things she looked at was the oxidization of, of injured synapses with complement factors, here looking at C1Q, and um, the way, and again, she took advantage of our ability to characterize uh, synapses molecularly as either having or not having a, sec a, a third marker, in this case, C1Q. Um, and when she did that quantification, she found that in the setting of injury, the number of opsonized synapses goes up substantially. Um, so it, it doesn't happen immediately, but then it rises and then, and then it starts to fall again. So there appears to be uh, a, a marking of the synapses with complement factors that might be driving their removal by, uh, by microglia. So um, Akshita wanted to inhibit that process and she did so using um, a, a, knockout, a knockout mouse line uh, that was deficient in uh, complement factor C3. And C3 is, is a kind of linchpin factor in the complement cascade. You, you may be aware that there are three different complement, main complement pathways. All of them hinge on C3. So when C3 isn't present, the complement system is largely inactive. So actually, I took these C3 knockout mice. She again did, uh, did this uh, model of focal brain injury. And, and what she found was, was, again, loss of synapses after TBI. But when complement is absent, there was, there was significantly less synapse loss. Um, suggesting again that this complement, complement microglial axis is important uh, in, in the removal of synapses post TBI. So we want to understand, of course, the functional significance of this. So uh, we we use this the, the Morris water maze to understand spatial learning and memory. And uh, what we found, uh, you know, sham animals do quite well in this. When one causes a TBI in sham animals, they learn much less well to recognize that platform. So they're they're spending much longer to find the platform and get out of the pool. Uh, mice don't like water, so they're trying to get out. 
when you look in the C2 knock, C3 knockouts, they do about as well as the shams. And when you look at the injured animals in the C3 knockout condition, at least by day four, they have learned better than animals uh, that have a functional complement system. Again, suggesting that the protection of synapses in these animals is important in their, their uh, uh, ability to uh, undertake this behavior. And when one looks at memory, so this in this case, we take the platform out of the pool and ask uh, after a, a short delay, how, how well does the mouse, mouse navigate to where that platform used to be? Uh, we find again that TBI has a significant effect on that, but in the presence of uh, uh, C3 knockout, uh, in, in activation of the complement system, the mice are, uh, uh, appear to have a better memory. So that's the neuroinflammation story. That paper should be out soon. Um, let me tell you now about some more preliminary data that we have with respect to proteinopathies. And this is the stuff I'm, uh, I'm really excited about these days, uh, but we still have quite a ways to go. So uh, uh, forgive me for that. This again is the work of Andrew Sauerbeck. Um, and you know, it's been known for some time that TBI induces a change in the levels uh, in the expression of proteins that are of interest with respect to nerve generation. So, and, and this, is, this is data from uh, one of many papers looking at tau isoforms using, in this case, a PET-based analysis showing that there are uh, statistically significant alterations and increases in uh, uh, pathological species of, of tau in the brain of patients after different forms of TBI. Um, there have been some approaches to try to understand how tau is acting at synapses. Um, but to tell you the truth, again, this was a situation where we surveyed the literature and, and didn't feel like this question had really been addressed terribly well at this point. Now we know that athoisoforms of tau in vitro get to dendritic spines in a way that normal isoforms tend not to. There have been very limited immuno-EM analyses of pathoisoforms of tau. Here, this is total tau or uh, you know, a pathological isoform suggesting that there might be an increase in tau at the synapses, but what's not been what's not been done well to our mind using either this approach or in this case array tomography is a comparison to what's going on elsewhere in the brain to ask whether there is truly an enrichment at the synapse or whether one's just seen tau everywhere. Uh, most of the work actually comes from the use of synaptosomes um, as ways of biochemically analyzing the components of synapses. Um, and, and that I think has been somewhat more informative, although again, it's, it continues to suffer from this issue of comparison. Um, the, the level of tau at the, in the synaptosome, which presumably is derived from synapses, versus that which one might find in another part of a neuron. That, that still becomes a tricky question to answer using synaptosomes. And I'm gonna make the case to you that either way, there are significant advantages to, to looking in situ as opposed to doing a biochemical analysis. And, and I'm certainly not saying that there isn't a lot of information that one can gain by doing a biochemical analysis, but, but here I'll, I'll try to give you an example of why, why an in situ type analysis has value, inherent value. So this is, this. Oh, Oh, I've ruined the surprise. Wrong button. <laughs> this is a, a two famous artworks. Um, and, and this is just a histogram of various pigments that are present in those artworks. And I think you'll agree that there, the information can be gleaned from this. There's no question that one can learn from this data. But one struggles to identify the, the key characteristics that you care about when it comes to these different forms of art just by looking at their components. So that's, that's the, at least the, the potential advantage of taking a fully in situ approach to, to understanding biology. Um, so the, the approach that we took was um, we, we injured these animals. In, in this case, we're, I'm going to tell you about our data with relation to tau. So we're, we're looking in the, the PS19 uh, model comparing to wild type litter mate controls, the best controls we think we can do. Um, but we're, we're doing this as well in models of amyloidosis. So we injured these animals. We take an early assessment and a late assessment. In both cases, we're looking at neurobehavioral and histological endpoints, although today I'm gonna to tell you about the histological endpoints. So at a macro scale, first of all, we, we immediately saw some interesting uh, issues here. So uh, this is AT8, which is a marker of phospholoserine 202 and phospholoserine 205. And in this case, I think you can see that um, this pathological isoform of tau accumulates with time. It doesn't, there doesn't appear to be much effect of TBI. It shows up in the expected areas. TBI doesn't have a huge effect on it, but, but look up here, for example. This is a AT100, which is a marker of phospholoserine 214 and phospholoserine H12. And in this case, one sees a delayed enhancement in the accumulation of that phospholisoform uh, in these animals as a result of TBI. Here's a different one, AT180. This is a marker of phospholoserine 231. 
here one sees an early increase and then a late fall off in the appearance of that isoform. So I think there's going to be a huge diversity of responses here um, that are going to be challenging, but also very interesting to characterize with respect to the effect of TBI on the appearance of these various pathological isoforms of tau. We've, we started to analyze this data. Here's how we're doing it. We parcelate the brain um, using these brain maps, uh, which are warped to the individual uh, uh, specimens. And then we can, from there, quantify the, uh, the amount of, of tau that we macroscopically see in, in different sections. And again, this is early with noisy data. I won't go into the quantification, but, but broadly it's showing you what you saw in, in the prior slide. Um, but as I mentioned, and as you, you know I want to get back to, we're trying to understand um, pathology at synapses. So what we've done is, is we've, uh, the data I'm going to show you now is in relation to this antibody, uh, which, which labels phosphotau uh, at 3 and 231. We quantified the amount of uh, tau present at, at synapses in the brain after injury, um, it, it, in the absence or presence of injury. So the way we do this is as follows. We, we find the synapses using our traditional sequence approach. Then we create a mask that encompasses that synapse in its immediate vicinity. We ask within that mask, how much tau are we seeing? That's, that's the basic idea here. And, and in so doing, what we're doing is basically recreating in situ a synaptosomal type preparation. And what we see is a significant enrichment of, uh, 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 I shouldn't say enrichment, we see, we see a lot of tau in these cases at the synaptic loci. The challenge we have here again is understanding how much of that is specific enrichment of the synapse and how much of that is just the fact that there's tau everywhere. So to get at that question, let's see if this movie will play. Um, we flip that tau channel. So we pull out this old trick of flipping, that, of flipping that channel. And now again, we have the same amount of tau, the same spatial statistics and so on, but we've broken the biological relationships. And what we find when we do that is we see much less tau at the synapses. So that suggests to, our, to us that there is a specific enrichment of tau at these synapses. Now, we wanted to take it a step further because I was concerned at that point that we still couldn't differentiate an enrichment of tau at synapses versus an enrichment of tau in neurons. So the way we tried to get around that problem was rather than making our mask at the synapses, we made our mask at these pre or post synaptic puncta that we felt were non-synaptic. So those are puncta that we believe to be neuronal, but yet are not, we don't think they're present at synapses. We think, you know, most of this is protein trafficking. So we did that, we did the same trick with the flip. And what we found was that when one looks at, at the raw data, one sees, again, an enrichment over the flip. So some of this is, I think, just enrichment in neurons. But when you flip it again, you see that fall away. So this difference represents the enrichment in neurons. This difference represents the specific enrichment to synapses. So on the basis of this, we felt we had a pretty strong argument that yes, tau actually does, pathological isoforms of tau do actually make their way to the synapse. And you know, there they might be doing uh, something nefarious. Uh, so to take this a little bit further, we started asking questions about, about that role. Um, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, there's, there's one other way that Andrew asked this question, and that was by using increasing dilations of this the synaptic mask. And what one finds is that as one gets closer to the synapse, one starts to see more specific uh, localization of the tau, which, which again, you know, makes sense. This, this again was encouraging to us. Whereas when one looks at a non-synaptic pre or post-synaptic punctum, you see some of that as well, which again, we think reflects neuronal enrichment, but not as much as you see at the synapse. Um, so sorry, now, now to, to try to get at this idea of what it might be doing there, we see synapse loss in, in various regions of the brain as a result of aging in this particular model. Um, and, and the first thing we did was look at correlations between synapse loss and phospho uh, uh, tau uh, uh, intensity within those regions. And although this correlation isn't terribly strong, it's highly significant. Um, so that gives us some indication that there may be a connection between the presence of phospho tau isoforms at synapses and the loss of synapses. Um, we're still working on that data set. Uh, and in the meantime, Andrew took a deep dive into some of this metadata that I told you about, these 400 odd uh, endpoints with relation to uh, each synapse that we can pull out of these data sets. Um, and what he did here was ask, what's the effect of the, the, of the uh, uh, tau, uh, the abnormal tau isoforms, and what's the effect of injury? Um, on the synapses themselves. So what he did, he took those 400 odd endpoints, he reduced them to the, I think the 25 or so that seemed to have the biggest 
uh, effect on the variance. And then he did principal component analysis. He found that the first four or five principal components seem to be driving the great majority um, of that, those group-wise differences. He trained that data set then on 80% of our animals, left out 20%. And he asked on the basis of those, I think, five principal components, how well could it predict for a given synapse in this, this, uh, this new data set how well could it predict the identity of that, so the group from which it came? And, and kind of amazingly, he found that with greater than 90% accuracy on the basis of these, these forms of, of metadata for these synapses, he could tell you whether a synapse was from an animal that was a, a wild type animal that had or had not suffered an injury, or whether this was from an animal that expressed abnormal isoforms of tau and whether or not it, it had uh, uh, experienced an injury. And this is just, again, uh, sort of, schematized for you here, where we're looking at the top three principal components, and you see these groups separate out into individual clusters. And I think it's really interesting that the transgenic animals appear to have two different groups. It's a bit hard to see because of the other colors, but it's almost like two butterfly wings here. And the injured animals seem to cluster along just this one. So we're now digging into this data set and trying to understand whether there's biological meaning um, in some of those different, uh, those different metrics. To try to tell you just a little bit uh, about some of those, um, some of the things that we've been looking at are PSD intensity, PSD volume, synapse and volume, synaptic intensity, and just just give you a flavor of the kind of things that we're finding. We see different responses of these things. So, for example, um, the uh, uh, PSD intensity seems to be uh, largely influenced by uh, genotype, with it higher in the transgenic, whereas PSD volume seems to be injury dependent. Synapse and volume. Um, uh, appears to be, uh, again, dependent on genotype and synapse and intensity, uh, there may be something additive going on there. So a lot of different patterns are emerging from this data set. And, and one of the things we're most interested in is, is digging further into that. So where are we going with this? Um, we want to characterize further uh, the mistargeting of tau uh, that results from tauopathy and injury across time and space. We want to further understand these molecular and nanostructural differences um, and what their biological meaning might be. We're really interested now in taking the behavioral data sets that we've collected and trying to connect some of this to the functional outcomes. And ultimately, the, the question we're trying to get at is, is TBI, does TBI have an additive effect of, of for example, reducing a reserve pool of synapses and then, and thereby just dropping the, the further number of synapses that need to be lost in order to result in a cognitive deficit? Or does TBI actually potentiate synaptic injury potentially through an early induction of a proteinopathic mechanism or a neuroinflammatory uh, mechanism that results in an accelerating uh, uh, synaptic neurodegeneration happening later in life. Um, and, and more immediately, we're working with groups uh, at Washington University that have had success targeting different domains of the cell with nanobodies to try to see whether we can alleviate some of the, um, this pathological localization of tau and see whether that has an impact on synaptic density and functional outcomes. So that, that, with that, I'll end the talk. And, and just I want to thank the people in the lab. This is, uh, uh, here is, where is it? There's Andrew, who did the majority of this work. Oxygen, unfortunately, isn't pictured here. There's Sydney Photobombing us, um, who helped out with a lot of this. Um, and I'll be happy to, to take your questions. Questions, is there? Yeah. Um, Michael, thank you. So the assumption between, behind everything you've told us almost implies that the synapse is autonomous, that the damage that happens to it is autonomous. But there are, there's differential sensitivity of traumatic brain injury for different cells. And so I was wondering if you began to pick out not the synapse type, but individual cells, would you see a different picture in terms of... Um, it's the cellular pathology that drives eventually the synapses that disappear because also you're looking at what's left, not what went away. And so I'm wondering what you think about that and how you think mechanistically about the fact that there is differential sensitivity of different cell types to a variety of traumatic brain injuries. Yeah, no, I, I feel like there are a couple questions there. <clears throat> one is related, yeah, one, one is related to the primacy of synaptic injury and the other is related to differential sensitivities of cell types. And we have not, so we have addressed this to some extent on the, on the level of synaptic selectivity. 
by, for example, what I just showed you, look, looking at what synapses remain, as, as you point out, we're looking at the synapses that remain. I wish we had a positive marker of synaptic injury. We don't. We're, we're using a negative marker of synaptic injury. And, and asking, you know, is it, is it the larger synapses that are lost? Is it synapses that express uh, you know, certain types of receptors that are lost? Answering that question on a cell-by-cell cell basis is not something that the technique currently can do. We have experimented with the idea of using, for example, sparsely uh, sparse cell-filling approaches, like some of the XFP mice, um, to try to trace the entire synaptic structures of a given neuron. That's exceedingly challenging, and we, we haven't successfully brought that to completion. So I don't know a whole lot about the cellular selectivity of this process, um, except to the extent that neurons express individual proteins, they have widely varying expression profiles, and a lot of those proteins make their way to the synapse. So by looking at the molecular characteristics of the synapse, we're indirectly looking at, at the cells. Um, your question about the primacy of synaptic injury is, is really much more fundamental and, and one that uh, keeps me up at night. And um, I cannot right now tell you what extent of the injury that we see is, for example, a result of just deafferentation? We have, we have done some work at early time points to, to try to tease it apart that way. We have used, we have tried to tease this apart in models where axonal injury is preserved, specifically SARM1 mutant animals. We keep running into Various, like the SARM-1, for example, we, we are unable to replicate what's been shown in the field about axonal protection in SARM-1 after TBI. So I haven't, I, I don't have a great way of doing this. I, I do think that there are interesting reasons to think that synapses are uniquely sensitive to trauma. Arguments have been made and published about unique biophysical characteristics of synapses being adhesive points in the brain, yeah, and in the impact of shear forces. So there are reasons in theory to think that they might be sensitive to this kind of injury, but I'm not aware of a data set from us or anyone else that proves that they are the, they are a primary source of injury as opposed to some kind of second. You know, yeah, it's a, it's a worrisome point. Mm -hmm. Hi, really nice talk. I'm interested in your guys' ability to localize different receptors at the synaptic resolution. I feel like that would be really revolutionary when you talk about the diversity of potential receptor complexes and how that might mediate different forms of synaptic plasticity. Yes, yeah, so, you mean like nanodomains. Sure, but yeah. like a, maybe an easier softball question would be with your MGLUR5 analysis, can you see, can you differentiate between synaptic versus extrasynaptic? Do you have that kind of resolution to, to have that nano domain structure that you just mentioned? Um, the short answer is no. Uh, the, the short answer is we, we can't identify or study the kind of synaptic nano domains that have been revealed with techniques like storm and palm. We, localization based microscopy approaches have the ability to exceed resolution limit of the microscope, which is nice, and we've taken advantage of that. So we can tell you where the centroid of a collection of mGluR5 is in relation to other structures in the synapse. So we can tell you, is it more likely to be presynaptic? Is it more likely to be postsynaptic? How likely is it to be synaptic versus extrasynaptic based on its location versus the pre to postsynaptic axis? Those are questions we can answer, but only on a whole synapse level. Like if there were three different collections of it in various locations, that would just confuse us. We would, we would triangulate the center of them and, and maybe not figure anything out. So that's the challenge. We can tell you where, Statistically, as a result of all of the receptors at that synapses, their center is located. We can do that with, you know, in theory, infinite precision. But so, we, do you see two hops, I guess, in your histogram? I haven't looked at that. Okay. Yeah, I haven't looked at that. But yeah, that looks great. Any other questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned the role of glial, cell, glial cells um, in synaptic pruning, but I was wondering if you thought about astrocytes and their role, especially in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or totally. um, disruption of like the blood brain barrier and how that might affect like potentiation of inflammation. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm sure that they're having a role and I, I'm sure there's an interesting story that, that we just haven't approached. But yeah, the, this idea of a quadripartite synapse with an astrocyte and a microglial cell is, is one that we continue to want to tease apart. But yeah, as you point out, we've, we've really only looked at microglia at this point, but I'm sure that they're having an important role.
Great. Um, if there's no more questions, let's uh, thank Terry again.